There are literally hundreds of courts in our country, but there's only one like this. It's the highest court in the land, the United States Supreme Court. And what's the first thing you see when you enter it? Nope, the first thing you see is equal justice under law. What does it mean? That the United States is a nation built on laws, and everyone must be treated equally by them. Everyone? From the youngest citizen to the highest official, all are bound and protected by the same laws. So though it's above the door, equal justice under law is really the cornerstone of the judicial branch of the United States government. Give me liberty or give me death. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Ask not what your country can do for you. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Equal justice is part of what is known as the rule of law. The rule of law means that laws, not kings or dictators, govern our society. Still, it's easier to carve a concept like equal justice into stone than to put it into practice. Just what equal justice is and who it really covers has been hotly debated since the earliest years of our republic. This is the place where laws meet their match, in the court. Now if I were to tell you there was a match in the court, you might assume I was talking about a light in the halls of justice. You might even think I was planning a game of tennis. The problem with words is they can mean different things to different people. And the same thing is true of laws. That's why someone has to decide what they mean and how they apply to specific situations. Because let's face it, in the end, a law is just words on paper. Laws are made by the legislative branch or Congress. They are put into action by the executive branch headed by the president, and they are interpreted by the judicial branch. Don't you think the court should have been informed of it? Most people think that when a law is enacted and it's written down, that's it. It doesn't need to be interpreted. The words are what they are. But in reality, that isn't the case. What happens is that a law gets passed, and then it's not clear to people exactly what it means or to whom that law applies. So that's the job of the courts. Oftentimes, the courts have to look at a law and say to people, this is what this law means. The courts oftentimes are in the business of interpreting the law. Back in 1787, the people who wrote the blueprint for our government, the United States Constitution, divided up power so that no one group would have too much control. It's called separation of powers. But even if the three branches are separate, they are not independent. Each one has ties to the others, creating a system of checks and balances. When our government was just starting out, no one knew exactly how the judicial branch fit into that system of checks and balances. In fact, the judiciary might have been completely overpowered by the other two branches, if not for a landmark court case. 1801. The country faces a constitutional crisis. In a last-ditch effort to save some of his party's power, outgoing President John Adams creates many new judiciary positions and fills them with his political allies. Adams also appoints his friend John Marshall to Chief Justice of the United States, the most important position on the Supreme Court. But when the next president, Thomas Jefferson, takes office, he is angered by Adams' last-minute attempt to retain power. Jefferson orders his Secretary of State James Madison to stop delivery on the remaining commissions, preventing many of Adams' appointees from starting their new jobs. One of them, William Marbury, is furious. He sues Madison for failure to perform his duty and brings his case directly to the Supreme Court. Whoa! Marbury versus Madison was one tense scene. You had John Marshall, the friend of the ex-president, officiating over a case that directly affected the power of the new president, Thomas Jefferson. There were even rumors flying that Jefferson intended to have Chief Justice Marshall removed from office. Fortunately, John Marshall believed that a strong and independent judicial branch is essential for a democratic government. 
It is emphatically the province of the Judicial Department to say what the law is. Marshall's solution to Marbury v. Madison was simple and brilliant. The Chief Justice agreed that Marbury should have gotten his commission, but ultimately he said that was not the point. The real issue was whether the Supreme Court should be hearing his case at all. Marbury's case had come before the court based on a law called the Judiciary Act of 1789. But the United States Constitution is clear about what kinds of cases can be heard by the Supreme Court. It's a pretty short list, and Marbury's was definitely not on it. The beauty of Marbury versus Madison is that with that case, we finally got a clear understanding of how the various court systems fit together and how they all should work together. Chief Justice John Marshall found that Marbury's case should have started in a lower court. And because it was in conflict with the Constitution, he also ruled that the Judiciary Act was unconstitutional. Marshall dismissed Marbury v. Madison, averting the political crisis. Most importantly, he established the Supreme Court as the last word on the Constitution. The court's power to decide if a law agrees with the U.S. Constitution is known as judicial review. Do you know what happens to a law that doesn't agree with the Constitution? I would think they would pass another law that counters it. A law that doesn't agree with the Constitution does not get passed. If the court decides that a law is unconstitutional, it is declared null and void as if it never existed. Marbury v. Madison was the first time the judicial branch declared a law made by Congress unconstitutional, firmly establishing the Supreme Court's ability to check the other branches of government. In America, some laws apply to the whole country, while others only concern individual states. So we have two different court systems, the federal court system for the whole country and the state court systems, one for each of the 50 states. State cases deal with cases that are based upon laws enacted by the states. Federal cases deal with cases based upon laws enacted by the federal government. So any federal laws are laws based upon the United States Constitution. And any state laws are based upon laws enacted by state legislatures and based upon state constitutions. A court's authority to hear a case is known as jurisdiction. And the first court to hear a case has original jurisdiction. State court systems have jurisdiction over the vast majority of court cases since most offenses happen within a single state's boundaries. Let's say somebody steals your car, takes it for a joyride, and leaves it on the next block. When the police nab the thief, he gets tried in the state court system. But if he whisks your wheels across state lines, he gets a one-way ticket to the federal court system. Crossing state lines moves jurisdiction from the state court system to the federal system, since the crime and apprehension of the offender happened in two different states. The state courts may do the bulk of the work, but there's still plenty of cases left over for the federal government. Most federal cases enter the system through the district courts. As the main trial courts in the federal system, district courts hear both criminal and civil cases. Criminal cases deal with broken laws anything from traffic violations to kidnapping. But civil cases involve private disputes, like bankruptcy and divorce. Every state has at least one district, and many have more. And every district has at least two judges assigned to it. Usually judges preside alone, though sometimes a panel of three judges hears a case. In all, there are about 630 district court judges hearing more than 300,000 cases per year. That's like 475 cases per judge. What a workload! When I'm sent a trial, a criminal trial, to preside over, there are lots of things that I have to do right away. I have to meet the lawyers, I have to find out what the case is all about from the lawyers, and then I have to make some decisions about what evidence can come into court and what can't come into court. And I do all of that before the jury is even picked. So I basically set all the rules up. Then the trial begins, witnesses testify, and I'm asked periodically to rule on objections, whether or not something is a proper question or not a proper question. We try the whole case, and then I have to instruct the jury about what the law is, what law is going to apply in this case. Then the lawyers get to argue the case, and I again have to decide if the argument is proper or not. 
And then I send the jury off to deliberate. They go off to deliberate, and while they're doing that, I get sent another trial, and I bring in the next load of lawyers, and we start the whole thing all over again. Most of the time, the district judge's verdict is final. But say you think the district court made an error somehow. You even believe that the mistake led the court to reach the wrong conclusion. Do you have to put up with it? No way. You can ask a higher court to take another look at that decision. It's called an appeal, which is why these courts are known as courts of appeals or appellate courts. Less than 15% of the cases from the district courts wind up in appellate court, and the number of courts shrinks accordingly. The more than 90 district courts are divided between a dozen judicial circuits, and each circuit has its own court of appeals. Here, it's determined if errors were made in the original trial. If so, the earlier decision can be overturned. Circuit court judges hear cases in panels of three. Are their decisions three times as good? The reason we have three is that there may be a variety of opinions as to whether or not what that judge did was right or wrong. And so we have decided to make the system a fair system. Instead of having one person look at what one other judge did, we're going to have at least three people, and they have to vote. And if two of the three agree, that's enough to have a decision come out of the appellate court to just let us know whether or not what that judge did was right or what that judge did was wrong. Well, if three judges are better than one, imagine what nine of them could do. And now, at the top of the pyramid, the creme de la creme, the only court created by the Constitution and the one they call Supreme, the United States Supreme Court. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of the United States, are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. It takes a special kind of case to make it to the highest court in the land, because decisions made here affect every other court in the country. Of the thousands of requests that come in each year, only about 150 get their day in this court. The Supreme Court has original jurisdiction on cases involving constitutional, interstate, and national and international issues. But that's a small fraction of the court's caseload. Mostly, the Supreme Court serves as the ultimate court of appeals, hearing cases from both the federal and the state court systems. It's up to the nine Supreme Court justices themselves to decide which cases they'll take on. What makes a case Supreme Court material? The Supreme Court is very picky in deciding what cases it will review. And it has to be picky. The Supreme Court cannot review every case that everyone wants it to review. They'd never get their work done. So the Supreme Court's job, really, is to decide cases that will have an important impact on everyone in society. For that reason, they must be very selective in the cases that they will hear. As the country's oldest and most distinguished court, the Supreme Court is heavy on tradition. For one thing, you don't call these folks judges, they're justices. At the top is the Chief Justice of the United States, and the other eight are Associate Justices. Behind closed doors, they debate the merits of each case, and what is said is a closely guarded secret. Every day starts with a group handshake, a custom started by Chief Justice Melville Fuller to remind the Justices that even though they might disagree, they need to be united in their purpose. Supreme Court justices often work together for many years, since federal judges are appointed for life. Once in, they're tough to remove. Only if a judge is suspected of behaving in a way unbecoming to the office can he or she be impeached by the House of Representatives. Talk about job security. Lifelong appointment means federal judges have got to be top notch. Justice John Paul Stevens once wrote, it is confidence in the men and women who administer the judicial system that is the true backbone of the rule of law. The first African American appointed to the Supreme Court, Thurgood Marshall, inspired such confidence. Prior to joining its bench, Mr. Marshall had a long association with the Supreme Court. As the legal director of the NAACP, he argued 32 cases before it, 
including Brown v. the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. In Brown v. Board of Education, the United States Supreme Court did something that was probably the most important thing it's ever done. And that is, by one decision, it made tremendous change in this country by helping those who had been kept out of the system, in this case, African-American people, from getting an equal education as those who were not African-American, by one decision enabled a whole group of people to have access to a public education system in this country. It's a wonderful example of how the courts can make wonderful and positive social change. During that case, Marshall expanded the notion of equal justice under law. Equal, he said, means getting the same thing at the same time and in the same place. It was a definition that would change America, made by an American original. The President of the United States nominates all federal judges, but the Senate must consent to the nominees. It's a check on the judicial branch by the legislative branch. Even though they're picked by the President and confirmed by the Senate, judges are beholden to neither. The independence of the judiciary is what makes it work. And what ensures the independence of the judiciary are the lifetime appointments of all of the justices. This means that when the justices occasionally have to make a decision that might not be very popular, these justices don't have to look over their shoulders and say, oh, I'm making someone unhappy. That means I might lose my job. What it means is that they have lifetime tenure. They can make the tough calls and make the courageous decisions and know that they will still have their jobs. How the Constitution is interpreted has widespread political implications. So why does everybody seem to have a different idea about how it should be done? Blame the Constitution. The people who wrote the Constitution, known as the framers of the Constitution, left it short and vague on purpose. They hoped a skeletal document would weather a changing society and stand the test of time. Their strategy worked. No other country in the world has such a long-lasting Constitution. Some believe that even though it's more than 200 years old, its words should still be taken literally. Like Justice Antonin Scalia, he says, The words are the law. I think that's what is meant by a government of laws, not of men. Others argue that it's not the words themselves that matter, but the original intent of the framers. But it's pretty tough to know for sure what some 18th century guy was thinking. And then there are those who believe the Constitution is a living document. Its interpretation has to change to suit the times. As our society changes, as we feel differently about different issues, there is always that Constitution, that bedrock, that foundation, that continues to say to people, these rights that people have in this country will always be here, no matter what we face, and no matter for how long we face them, these rights will always be there. The Constitution continues to live, as do we. For instance, the framers could never have foreseen the Internet. Yet we can take the underlying principles of freedom of speech granted by the First Amendment and apply them to it. So the Constitution stands still, but society changes all the time. No wonder interpreting the Constitution is so tricky. If you stick to the letter of 18th century law, you run the risk of becoming seriously out of date. Then again, if you modernize too much, you might lose sight of the framers' original ideas. It's a balancing act that is constantly played out in the Supreme Court. December 1965. In Des Moines, Iowa, several students decide to wear black armbands to school to protest the war in Vietnam. Worried that the armbands will disrupt classrooms, school authorities issue a statement banning them. 16-year-old Christopher Eckhart, 15-year-old John Tinker, and his 13-year-old sister Mary Beth wear them anyway. Oh man, you can see what's coming. Kids go to school, flaunt the rules, big riot erupts, teachers freak out, kids get thrown out of school, lives are ruined. Oh. Actually, none of that happened. The students wore the armbands, but no disturbances occurred. Still, all three kids were suspended. Angry and frustrated, the students decided to sue the school district for violating their First Amendment right to free speech. 
Tinker versus the Des Moines Independent Community School District went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. At the heart of the case was whether kids in public schools have a right to free speech at all. One of the biggest holes in the school district's argument, that the students were disruptive, was effectively exposed by Associate Justice Thurgood Marshall. The court found that the protest had not been disruptive, but that the civil rights of Christopher Eckhart and Mary Beth and John Tinker had been violated. Writing the opinion for the majority of justices, Associate Justice Abe Fortas noted, It can hardly be argued that either students or teachers shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse gate. In our system, state-operated schools may not be enclaves of totalitarianism. But two of the nine justices disagreed. Justice Hugo Black wrote, I wish wholly to disclaim any purpose on my part to hold that the federal constitution compels the teachers, parents, and elected school officials to surrender control of the American public school system to public school students. I dissent. You know, the process of Tinker versus Des Moines was just wonderful. I mean, it was great, because what you had, you had the justices disagreeing, arguing, and you know they argued because two of the justices, at least, had very different views and very different positions on what should happen in the case. And that's the beauty of the whole system. The beauty is that you bring people together with different views, with divergent positions on an issue. They talk, they discuss, and sometimes they argue, but in the end, they come out with a decision, and most of the time, it's the right decision. It's the right call. That's the phenomenal power of the judicial branch. From the district and state level on up to the Supreme Court, it constantly interprets and applies the thousands of laws that govern the American people. Tinker versus Des Moines changed the way people thought about the First Amendment rights of kids. In a very real sense, it expanded the idea of who equal justice applies to. You and me!